Hi, welcome to uh, the first in a series of what I hope to be some really great informative guitar lessons that I can present to you through uh, my YouTube channel here. Um, a quick rundown on what my goal is here um, to provide is I, I was a guitar teacher for many, many years and to many, many students. And over those years, I, I learned a lot about how to present pieces of information uh, to the students that I was teaching and, and trying to, to find the fastest way for them to be able to absorb that information and, and really you know, making it seem a lot less intimidating than a lot of other um, maybe online lessons or, or books had made it in the past. Um, I find a lot of times people were just intimidated by certain things that they didn't really need to be in and, and that could have just been in the way that uh, the, the information was presented to them. And it's a real shame to, to not be able to utilize a piece of information uh, or something we can apply to the guitar just because it was presented to us incorrectly. So a lot of the things I'm gonna cover are, are not gonna be anything new information-wise. I mean, we, we live in an age where uh, everything is as simple as a keyboard stroke away, uh, you know, typing it into Google or, or simply asking our, our phone, you know, what's a pentatonic scale? What is the musical alpha, you know? There, there's endless information, but it's whether or not we can absorb that information in a useful way. And that's my goal here is to really take guitar lesson videos to a new place where we can hopefully easily understand really pertinent pieces of information that can help us to play rhythm guitar, lead guitar, etc. So um, I'm going to be doing a series of videos um, that are going to range in difficulty level right from very beginner stuff to intermediate to advanced. Even the beginner material though, um, I think is is gonna be something that can help even more advanced or possibly you know intermediate to even more advanced players. Uh, because I, I'll always try to give a unique approach um, to even that simple information and how we can apply it to more complex things. So um, it's probably a good idea just to kind of stick with me through this even if you feel like I'm covering something that maybe is something you already know because if I am covering I'm probably going to try to apply it to some other uh, uh, co context later on uh, another another uh, topic maybe from another uh, lesson that I'm going to do in the future is going to refer back to the things I talked about here. So I don't want to go too on too long about this um, but basically um, this first lesson, I, I wanted to start with a topic that I found to be a big issue with a lot of players in that they never really got to know their fretboard really well, right? Um, guitar can be a little bit of an intimidating instrument when it comes to actually learning the names of the notes over the entire fretboard in a way that's going to be useful and almost instantly accessible to us you know do I need to know that this is an E and 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 all, all these different notes um, where they lay on the fretboard a lot of people think but I don't even need to know that what's the difference and I probably fell in that camp way back when I first started 30 some years ago uh, I couldn't really understand why do I need to know those notes right it as you progress though, as a player, it becomes very clear to you that that's an extremely important skill to have on the guitar, but one that a lot of players tend to struggle with, and there's some reasons behind that. And I think that it can be one of the easiest things in the world to learn, and that's what I'm going to show you today. Let's master our fretboard in a few very simple steps. Okay, A lot of times what happens is we look at a task at hand, something like I'm going to memorize the fretboard. Tell me if uh, any of you remember this graphic that's going to come up on the screen. I remember seeing these fretboard diagrams, whether in poster form in a music store or in a guitar magazine lesson. Um, and it was just basically a picture of the fretboard, you know, the six strings, all the frets, and the notes, names, sort of plastered on each fret. And it just looked like the most confusing, crazy thing. And I thought, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to memorize this or learn it, right? Until I started teaching, um, did I come up with a way to present this information in a way that could get somebody to learn that in a very quick and easy fashion? I kind of wish, looking back, that I had 
been taught with the method that I am teaching this now with, I would have learned it much, much faster. Now, before I get into that, somebody might ask, why do I need to know all the, the names on the fretboard? Well, that, that's, that is a good question, right? Um, let's take lead guitar, for example. You know, a lot of us intermediates to advanced players, even some beginners, know things like, you know, the pentatonic scale. The guitar is a very pattern-oriented instrument, right? So we can learn this pattern and feel, okay, I've got the pattern. Who cares what the notes are? Well, one example would be, you know, oftentimes when we're using this pentatonic scale to do some soloing or improvising, we're going to be playing over top of a chord progression. So maybe that chord progression is going to have a C major chord of some sort played somewhere on the neck, right? What if I do know my fretboard real well and I can instantly look and say, well, I know that this C major chord, regardless of where I played it, is made up of three notes, right? C, E, and G. Okay. Wouldn't it make sense then that if I also know in my pattern which notes are C, E, and G, that I could play licks and maybe accentuate those notes more, making for a better lead, right? I, instead of just haphazardly playing a lick and landing on a note that maybe isn't a chord tone, which might be what you want, but you want to do that because that's what you want, not just because it happened, right? So if I know that in this pentatonic pattern I was doing that, you know, there's my C notes, there's my E notes, right? There's my G notes. If I'm playing a lick and I want to land on a C, I know that C is there. Or, it'd land there. If I want it to land on an E, I know that E is there, or here. G's there, right? So that's just one example as to why we would want to get a good working knowledge of our fretboard. So how do we do this in the easiest fashion possible? One analogy I used with a lot of students was that of, you know, eating a meal, right? Uh, a lot of times we're overwhelmed with information. Um, maybe it's learning scales. Uh, maybe it's learning our fretboard. And it just seems like such a huge task that we can't uh, maybe conquer or, or, or accomplish. I oftentimes say, well, if you have a big meal in front of you on your plate, we don't try to eat that meal in one bite. So what we can think of when we're trying to absorb a piece of information on the guitar is the same thing. What would we do with that meal? Well, we take small bites. We chew them, then they're easy to digest. We don't have any problems. We don't choke, right? So we don't want to choke on this information we have. So instead of trying to just jump in and, and, and take all this information in one shot, let's find ways to break it into tiny, tiny bite-sized bits that we're gonna be easily able to grab and digest and absorb, right? Um, and remember, and then in that way, it's gonna be a lot more useful. Okay, so here's how we're going to master the fretboard. And I think it can be done in a very simple way. I'm about to tell you some things that are gonna to seem to uh, some players who've been playing for a while, like they're very primary basic uh, things, but stick with me on this because I'm going to glue all of these little tiny little bits of information together so that we can master the fretboard, okay? First thing we need to do, we need to understand a little bit about music theory, okay? Um, the music, I mean, music has an alphabet to it, okay? Uh, much like our normal alphabet, the musical alphabet is going to start on A and it's only going to go as far as G, okay? So we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Those are what we call our natural notes, all right? So remember that name because with what I'm going to tell you next, you're going to understand why we have to call them natural. So the note A, which oftentimes is just referred to as A when people are talking about it, could also be referred to as A natural. B is B natural and C is C natural. Now you might ask, why do we need that extra descriptive term natural attached to the note? Well, that's because the musical alphabet also contains something called sharps and flats. What a sharp does, and I'm going to put some graphics up on the screen so we can see what the symbols look like and understand when we see them written. A sharp is simply a symbol. It looks kind of like a number sign or a tiny tic-tac-toe board, however you want to, you want to think of it, or in nowadays, a, a hashtag, right, for all the social media folks out there. So um, a sharp simply moves a note on the guitar one fret higher. So that would make the pitch higher. So that would be moving this way on the guitar. Right? So if I knew that this note here is A, and I move that one fret higher, 
to the sixth fret instead of the fifth fret, that note is now A sharp. It's that simple. I guess the opposite of a sharp, if you want to use the term opposite, would be a flat. Okay, and a flat looks like, if it's written, a little slanted B. Um, and when we have that on a note, that does the exact opposite. It moves a note back one fret. So if this, again, was A, if I move that back one fret, now I'm going to be playing A flat. Very simple, nothing to it, okay? There's other terms that you're going to hear for this. The movement of one fret on the guitar is referred to as a semitone or a half tone. Uh, the movement of two frets is going to be a whole tone. These are musical terms you'll hear, they're good to know, but for our purposes here I'm going to be referring to them as just single frets, forward and backward for simplicity's sake, okay? So anywhere we are, if we move up one fret, that's a semitone, if we move back one fret, that's a semitone. If we're on a natural note and we move up a fret, for most of the natural notes, and we'll talk about this in a second, it becomes the sharp of that note. So A would become a new note called A sharp. Or if we move it back a fret, it would become a new note called A flat. Okay? Pretty simple. Now, there is something interesting that happens though. If we move from A up two frets, this note becomes B. So right in between A and B, we have both an A sharp and a B flat. So this note could actually be named in two ways. It could be called a sharp or a flat. In this case, it would be an A sharp or a B flat. So in some cases in music, depending on the key we're in, we will refer to that note as an A sharp, and in other cases we'll refer to it as a B flat. Both are correct, both are fine, uh, and anybody in the know in music that has this knowledge will understand what you're talking about with them. Okay, so let's go back to the musical alphabet then. What we have is, we, like we mentioned, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G all the way up. That's seven notes, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. What happens after that is it starts over again at A. Now, that movement from A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, to another A is called an octave. We've gone through all the notes of the musical alphabet and we're back up to another note called A. Now, those two A's are similar notes, but one will sound lower and one will sound higher. So, for instance, this is A, this is A. You can hear the similarity in the sound, but one has a lower sound, one has a higher sound. We can keep going. There's another A, so A, 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 and another A up there, okay? So that's how the octaves work. But in each octave, we have to fit these sharps and flats in. Now, the easiest way to remember it, like I already told you, we have A here and we have B here. Well, in between, we have a note called A sharp and we have another note called B flat. Okay, well, those are the same note, that's fine. The where it gets slightly more complicated is there's two pairs of notes that don't have sharps and flats between it, okay? So in between the notes B and C, and in between the notes E and F, there are no sharp and flat. So what that means in the guitars, if we go back to our example here, this was A, I said that this was B at the seventh fret, and in between here would be A sharp or B flat. If I go back to the B here in the seventh fret and I move up one fret, we don't call it B sharp. That just goes to C, or C natural. Okay, same thing as if we have an E somewhere. Here's an E on the guitar. If I move up one fret from that, one fret higher, that goes directly to F, okay? So the first piece of information that we need to memorize, and when I say memorize, I mean really internalize. Get to know it so well that it's just uh, instinctive to you to, to uh, recall that information and be able to, to recite it just effortlessly, right? Basically, we have a musical alphabet that I would describe as such. Musical alphabet starts on A, it goes to G. In between each pair of notes, A to B, we have a sharp and a flat. That is a single note with two names. The only notes that don't have sharps and flats would be B and C and E and F. Okay, now you might say, well, what does that have to do with guitar or knowing my fretboard? Well, it has a lot to do with it because at whatever point I'm on on the fretboard, if I know the name of the note where I'm at at that moment, I can very quickly kind of move up a fret or two and know what those notes are as well. So for instance, if I went to this note here, seventh fret on the third string, well, that's a D, okay? Well, I know then D sharp is right there, that's easy. And that's gonna be E, right? It's really simple if we know our alphabet, we know that that's a whole step, it's gonna be D to E, and in between we have our sharp and our flat, D sharp or E flat, right? If I take my D and go backwards, I know that that's a D flat or a C sharp, so then that's gotta be a C. So whatever note we are at, 
once we know what that note is and we understand the musical alphabet and how the semitones or single fret moves work on the guitar, we can very quickly find all the surrounding notes, almost effortlessly. You know, anybody who knows their alphabet from A to G basically can do this. And it becomes a very simple thing. And you'll notice on those, you know, fretboard charts that I was talking about before, that's exactly what it did. If you look at it, right, it'll tell you that this is F and this is F sharp, this is G, this is G sharp. Right? But it's just the fact that we see all those together and we kind of panic, right? Okay, so we understand how we can move around now and name the notes uh, using our musical alphabet, right? A to G, sharps and flats between all the notes except for B and C and E and F. So that's the first piece of information we really have to get to know and internalize. Okay, so after that then, what we need to do is we need to create reference points. Obviously, if I say to you, I have a 22 fret guitar, Right? There's six strings on this guitar times 22 frets. That's 132 notes. If I just said to you, okay, well now that you understand that, just go memorize all 132 notes. That's where everybody gets lost. That's why these fretboard diagrams are, are kind of useless. Right? We look at it and we just get overwhelmed with information. We go, I'm not gonna remember all of this. So what we do is we shrink that down into a bite-sized portion, like I was mentioning before. And we create reference points. Instead of memorizing 132 notes, or even more on a 24 fret guitar, let's just simply memorize 12 notes. Already by mentioning that, somebody else would say, somebody listening would say, okay, it sounds much better. I can memorize 12 notes, right? So the reference points that I like everybody to memorize are these, the open strings, okay? Now, before I go on and name those, let's just number our strings as well, just so everybody's clear when I'm referring to which number string we're talking about. Our thickest string, down here is going to be our sixth string and our top string, what we call our top string, or our thinnest string is going to be string number one. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, just so we're clear on that. And again, that's a very simple piece of information, but very important if we're gonna communicate about these things. So um, we have our six strings, let's name them. This is something most people already know, even if they're just a beginner, right? This is the type of thing that we see written on the back or front of most guitar string packages we've uh, we've purchased or uh, you know when we're changing strings on our guitar. So we've seen this. It's the uh, if we have a if we have a guitar tuner, you know, maybe a little clip on or a, a, a pedal tuner. If we're in standard notation or standard sorry standard, standard tuning, uh, those are the notes that are going to come up when we hit that string. If our guitar is close to being in tune, right? So they are as such: sixth string here, starting at the the lowest note, is E, then A for the fifth string, D for the fourth string, third string is going to be G. Second string is going to be B, and the first string is going to be E again. So here we have E and D, right? So again, it goes from six to first, or lowest string, thickest string, to highest string, thinnest string. E, A, D, G, B, E. E, A, D, G, B, E. If I said to you, you have uh, 10 minutes to memorize that, I don't think there's going to be too many people that are going to panic about that. They're going to go, okay, cool, I can get to know that. And we do want to get to know it and internalize it to the point where it's second nature to know those notes. And you're gonna see why when we start to use this to map our fretboard out and really master our fretboard. That's the first reference point we need to know. The second reference point we need is going to be up here at the 12th fret. Now on most guitars, the 12th fret is oftentimes signified by two dots. And even on the side, if you have side markers, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but two dots right there. So we know, a lot of people question, well, why are there two dots at the 12th fret? Well, that's marking the point of an octave. And if you remember, I mentioned an octave is when we've gone through the entire musical alphabet. We've started on A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and we go back to A. So on each string, if we map out our notes, we start with the open string as being E, and that's kind of thought of as being right here behind the nut, not that we have to press there, but if we think of that as the location of the open string, it makes it easier, because if I move up a fret, it goes F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. We've moved up an entire octave, and now we're at a higher version of this E, okay? So think of what we just learned. We learned the open string names were E, A, D, G, B, and E. Well, guess what the 12th fret's gonna be if we're pressing here? This note's gonna be E, this note's gonna be A, this note's gonna be D, this note's gonna be G, this note's gonna be B, and this note's gonna be E again. So really, if we spend a few minutes memorizing the open string notes, we also know the 12th fret notes.
Okay, so pretty simple, I, I think. And again, with minimal effort, we're gonna be able to memorize that. But I don't think that's enough reference points. We're going to learn one more place. And the, the place that I pick, you could really pick any place, but there's a reason why I picked the fifth fret. Okay, there's an interesting thing that happens on the guitar at the fifth fret in the way it's tuned. If I go to my sixth string and I count up my notes again, uh, like I did towards the 12th fret, realizing something though, that the fifth string, like we've already discussed, open is called A. So if I go to my sixth string, I go E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, a. Well, that note there is an A and the open string is an A. So if you listen to those two notes, if your guitar is in tune, those two notes should be identical. Okay, if your guitar is out of tune, then you need to tune it <laughs> and then they will be identical. So this is A, this is A. Okay, easy enough. Well, that goes almost all the way up the fifth fret, except for one little tuning anomaly we have on the guitar between the third string and the second string, the, the G string and the B string. Uh, that's tuned slightly different uh, in that the B actually lands at the fourth fret. So what it gives us is just another set of notes that are gonna be fairly easy to memorize with one little twist to it. So the fifth fret notes, if I play those across all strings, would be A, D, G, C, E, and A. You know, always the first string and the sixth string are gonna be the same because they're both E open. Well, they're both gonna be A at the fifth fret, right? So again, we have A, D, G, C, E, and A. All right, if we memorize nothing else other than the open strings, again, E, A, D, G, B, E, the 12th fret, which is exactly the same thing, E, A, D, G, B, E, and then the fifth fret, A, D, G, C, E, A. If we memorize that, and we have the knowledge of our musical alphabet, we now can name any note on our fretboard with minimal effort and a little bit of practice, okay? So let's think about that then. If I said to you, okay, we now have memorized our open, our fifth, and our 12th fret. And somebody says, you know, it lands on the note at the seventh fret on the fourth string. Well, we, we don't know that note off the top of our head because that wasn't one of the reference points we memorized. But we think of what the closest note is. And we go, well, the closest one that I do have memorized is my fifth fret. And I automatically know, because I've memorized this, that that's G. Well, if this is G, this would be G sharp, one fret higher, and the one I'm on is A. So I quickly know that this note is an A, right? With minimal effort. Now, again, let's qualify this and say that we really do have to know that our open strings, our fifth fret and our 12th fret effortlessly, automatically, almost instinctively to be able to then use that to access other notes. We also have to know that piece of information with the musical alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, sharps and flats between all the notes except for B and C and E and F. Okay, so I hope we're clear on that. If not, rewind, listen again, and just try to, to get that down before we move on, okay? So far, not, doesn't seem like super complicated information. It, it might seem a little overwhelming, but again, we just take it a step at a time. If all you accomplish in one day is memorizing the names of your open strings, then, and you didn't know that the day before, then you're already better than you were before. So, great, don't, don't sweat it, and just, when you feel ready to move on to the next piece of information, then you move on to that. It's great. Now, for you advanced players out there, you might be wanting to see some crazy fast leads up, but this is all very important information. And if you already know it, wonderful, move on, you know. If you don't, though, and you feel even slightly less comfortable with this type of a thing, you know, work on it until it's really absorbed inside of you and you can utilize it in your playing. All right, so you say, okay, I can now locate pretty much any note on the fretboard. And you can even test yourself, right? You can say, okay, you know, 10th fret, third string. Okay, I'm closer to the 12th. I know that this is G, so this would be G flat or F sharp, and this would be F. Using this system, no matter where we land, we're never more than three frets away, three frets away from any of our reference points we already know. Now, some people say, yeah, but what about up here on the, you know, uh, beyond the 12th fret? What happens when I get way up here to this note? Well, it's the same thing, right? At the 12th fret, everything starts over again. So if you think about it, the 5th fret and the 17th fret are going to be the same thing. So if this was A, D, G, C, E, A, then the 17th fret will also be A, D, G, C, E, A. So again, there's no extra memory work. We just got to know that the 17th fret is that. So now if I'm up here, you go, oh, what note is that? I go, well, I know that this is A, so therefore this is B. It's that simple. This is C. This is going to be G. This is going to be D. It's that easy. And I'll tell you, this really 
doesn't take a long time before you start to visualize things in your fretboard very easily. All right, so let's move on. Now, we talked about the way that we kind of tune the guitar using two similar notes, you know, where we said that the open string here is A, and then that same A occurs here on the sixth string at the fifth fret. Well, that gives us another interesting pattern to map out our fretboard, okay? And it's what I kind of refer to as the fifth fret method, which kind of maybe isn't totally accurate because there's going to be that little tuning anomaly that we mentioned before between the second and the third strings. So let's discuss this. Basically, I know that this open string, A, the identical note exists right here. Well, if that's the case on the guitar and we have this kind of five fret span on the adjacent string lower, that's going to be the identical note, wouldn't that work for other places on the fretboard, right? If I was at the uh, fifth fret on the fourth string, I know that that note's G, couldn't I just simply go up five frets? So I'm on the fifth fret, add five to it, and it's up to 10. So 10th fret on the A string is also going to be a G, right? So those two notes are going to be identical. And this is going to keep moving up. Right? We can see how those notes are exactly the same, right? So this is a very important thing we can use as well. We simply, wherever we are on the guitar, we can move up five frets and a string lower in pitch or the thicker string down, right? However you want to think of it. And we're going to have the same note. Now, the only problem with that is it doesn't work between the third string and the second string because of that little tuning anomaly we talked about before on the guitar. So between the second string and third string, it's only going to be four frets band. Okay, so those four frets will be the same note. So E at the fifth fret on the second string, five plus four, nine. I can go to the ninth fret on the next lowest string or thicker string, uh, just to be clear. And that's also gonna be an E. F, 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 sharp, F, sharp, and so on and so forth. So we'll keep that one in mind as well because that's gonna be a very important little technique we can use to add some, uh, uh, to make things a little bit easier for us. Okay, let's move on to octaves now. This is the final piece of the, the fretboard mastery uh, or fretboard mapping tool puzzle we need. Uh, the octave is a super powerful thing. Uh, and the guitar is such a pattern-oriented instrument that if we can learn the patterns that octaves lay in on the guitar, we can then use that as a really big piece of the puzzle to getting around our fretboard, okay? Now, um, just to reiterate again, an octave is the span of eight notes on the guitar, thus the term oct, the, the, the prefix oct, right? So. We said we have the note A in the musical alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The eighth note is going to be back to another A, right? And that could be on any note. I could be on E, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E. Eight notes later is going to be E again, one octave apart. One's going to be lower, one's going to be higher. We can continue up that um, basically scale until we run out of notes on our instrument, right? Okay, so you say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well. There's a really interesting kind of almost visual pattern on the guitar that's going to allow us to know where an octave or two are going to be located when we, from any given note we're at. I'll give you an example. Back to my A on the sixth string. Okay, if I'm on this note and I wanna find another A very quickly, and this is something a lot of people already know, and they, they actually use it to write riffs sometimes and write songs, and a lot of players made a real signature style of it. West Montgomery, a uh, jazz player, was famous for using octaves, right? And they were, they were absolutely uh, great sounding little, uh, little ideas he came up with um, from them. The reason he could use them so effortlessly is because it's a little shape on the guitar. And if you notice, I'm on the first finger is on the fifth fret on the sixth string. If I skip the fifth string and move to the seventh fret on the fourth string, that's automatically going to be an octave. So this is an A and this is another A. I know that automatically. And this is going to be a movable pattern. If I'm on G and I do that same pattern, two frets higher, so if I'm on the third fret, it's gonna be the fifth fret, and two strings higher, that's going to be both Gs, both F sharps, both Fs. 
pretty simple. Beauty of this is, that's also going to work if my index finger note or the lowest note is on the fifth string. Same pattern. Okay, that's, there's my octave sound, right? It's the same thing as almost like the traditional power chord that everybody knows, right? Except, split it down a string. Right? It's that simple. So very simple, and I'll have those graphics up on the screen. So that's fine if our root notes or our, our, our lowest notes is on the sixth string or the fifth string. But something happens because of this tuning anomaly on the guitar. Once we move to our, our index finger being on the fourth string, we have to spread that pattern apart by three frets. Okay, so if I'm on the third fret, I gotta move up to the sixth. Okay, no, no more difficult really. I mean, whatever fret, whatever finger you find comfortable. I'm using my pinky, but I know some people use their third, especially if they're up here. So whatever works for you. And that is going to continue if we move up another string. So again, if I'm on the fifth fret on the third string now, again, up on the first string is going to be three frets higher. So if I'm on the fifth, it's going to be the eighth. If I'm on the third, it's going to be the sixth. Okay, pretty simple. So here's my patterns going across the strings. Octave, octave, I move to the next one. I stretch it out one more fret, octave. Very simple once you get the hang of it. Most people will just use that to play riffs or make up, a, make up a riff or learn somebody else's riff, you know. But this is a very powerful tool for mapping on our fretboard. Here's why, okay? So now we've talked about knowing our open strings in our fifth fret and our 12th fret as our reference points. We talked about knowing our musical alphabet. We talked about using this so-called fifth fret method where once we find a note somewhere, we can move up five frets from it into a string lower, and that's gonna be the identical note, except for between the second and third strings where it's only gonna be a four frets band, right? So those are gonna be powerful tools for being able to utilize with the knowledge of the musical alphabet to locate the name of any note. So let's say I was you know, at the seventh fret on the sixth string, and I said, oh, I know my reference point here on the fifth fret is going to be A, therefore this note's B. Got it. How can we quickly locate other Bs? Well, we can use our octave patterns. So right away, you'll see why I'm using my second finger in a second. There's an octave, but wouldn't there also be another octave to that note right there? So don't I have three Bs instantly? Very simple, right? So if I was playing a guitar solo and I needed to land on a B note to go along with whatever my chord was playing. Yeah, I know where those Bs are, sorry for the sloppy playing, but uh, I know where those B notes are effortlessly because of my reference points and then my octaves. So we can kind of see um, how, those are going to exist. And that also goes if we move up to the fifth string, right? Okay, same thing, same pattern. So we quickly, no matter where we are, if this note's C, I have another C here and I have another C here. Automatically. It's that easy. Okay? If I'm on uh, F sharp here, there's three F sharps. Doesn't matter where I am. G sharp, G sharp, G sharp, G sharp. It's that simple and that effortless to locate those notes using the octave patterns. Okay, there's a couple other octave patterns we need to know as well. We had mentioned before that the sixth string open is called E and the first string open is called E. So those are gonna be the same note, aren't they? So it stands to reason then that if I move both of those up to the first fret, first fret on the sixth and first fret on the first, that's gonna both be F, F sharp, G. So that's another very fast way to know where another a is, or another B, or whatever note we're dealing with. My example that I used a minute ago with B, I have a B here, a B here from my first octave, my B here from another octave. Would I also not have a B right here? 
So now I have a fourth one. Now, somebody might say, well, that's the same as that one. You're absolutely right. But it gives us another place to access it depending on what we're doing soloing wise. Maybe I'm... I want to be there, or maybe I go... And I know it's there also, and I can access it just as quickly. So no, the more places you know where it is, the better it's going to be, regardless of whether it's the same note or not. Okay, so hopefully that's clear so far. So again, wherever I am, if this was G, G on the sixth string, G, G, G. So I've mapped out all the Gs from the third fret to the eighth fret that quickly. Okay, well, let's move that now. So one more octave pattern we need to know, and we mentioned it already, but we want to kind of remind ourselves that it exists, right? Remember I said the open string is E, and the 12th fret is E here on the 6th string. The open 5th is A, 12th fret is A. As we move up, it stays the same. So the 12th fret is also an octave. So E, E, A, A, B, B, G, G, B, B, E, E. That's another handy octave to have. So let's now take this all the ideas we've talked about, the five fret method, remember again, if I have a note here at the fifth fret, I could move up five frets to the 10th fret and move a string lower, I'm gonna have that same note. G, right? So here would be D, D, G, C. I get to the second string, I have to move in not five frets apart, but four, E, A, and go back to the fifth fret. So I've got, Right? So I know that those notes exist in many places. Taking that a step further, I could say, well, this is A here. Well, if I move up five frets, that's A. Move up four frets to this string, that's A. Move up five frets again, that's A as well. I could do it with the open E. E, up five frets, four frets, five frets, five frets. So there's all those E's as well. Using that, using our reference points we talked about, and using the octave methods, watch how quickly I can find notes now on the guitar. I'll just use G as an example. Here's a G. I automatically can go, this is G. My first string's gonna be G because we know that those always mirror each other. I can find my octaves, G, G, G. Now I could say using this fifth fret method, if I take this G right here, wouldn't that also exist five frets higher right here? So I move my first finger up to there and now I've got my octave pattern. So now I've found three more Gs. Then I could take, here's, this is the neat part. Once we understand so many ways of doing this, we can take this, move it up five frets to the 15th fret here on the sixth string, and that's gonna be G, which would also be octave that we talked about between the first string and the sixth string, right? So this would be our next G, 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 G. Right? And then if you look, one, two, three, four, five, there's another G there if you really wanted to get particular about it, right? So, watch what we have. We have G, 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 I've just located every G on the guitar really effortlessly. You might say, well, okay, why do I need that? Well, it's like we talked about before, right? If I'm playing a chord, I now automatically know what notes are in that chord. Uh, if I'm playing a lead, I can now access, if let's say I'm playing something in G and I'm... It doesn't matter where I am on the fretboard, I can locate those G notes effortlessly and quickly. If it was, uh, you know, the G minor chord that I was playing, and I know, well, there's also a B flat in there, and there's also a D in there. I can take the same and decide to, to pinpoint the Ds instead. Or the B flats, right? Sorry, there's the G, right? So G, B flat, D. I know where they are at every given moment, okay? So all of the things we talked about today, learning the musical alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G sharps and flats between all the notes except for B and C. So in between A and B, we have A sharp and B flat. That is the same note. There's no sharp and flat between B and C. There's no sharp and flat between E and F. Great, we need that to map out our fretboard. We talked about our open strings being called E, A, D, G, B, and E from the sixth to the first. The 12th fret being called E, A, D, G, B, and E. 
from the sixth to the first. The fifth fret being called A, D, G, C, E, and A. All right, using those reference points, we can then pinpoint the names of any other note on our fretboard effortlessly. We then talked about the fifth fret method where a note that lays on the fretboard can be moved up five frets and to the next lowest in sound, sound-wise, the next lowest adjacent string, and that's gonna be the same note. So there we have two Cs, right? Okay, very simple. That can be used to move our octaves around and to just find other examples of the same note. It can also be used to tune our guitar, which is an added bonus. Um, then we talked about all the octave patterns. So we had these shape-based octave patterns. And we talked about how we can spread those over numerous octaves. We talked about this octave pattern between the first and the sixth string. And we talked about the octave from the first to the twelfth. If we can absorb those smaller bites of information, then we can simply master the fretboard in a fraction of the time we would have if we just grabbed one of those fretboard diagrams and said, hey, here's all the notes, memorize them. You know, 132 of them, go. It's crazy, we're not going to do that. And that's the point of frustration for most players, and that's why most players simply don't get to know their fretboard. They might know a few notes here and there, but they go, ah, I know my pentatonic scale, so that's good enough. I don't need to know the names of the notes within it. But it is such a liberating thing when we do get to know our fretboard, and our playing will improve dramatically because of it. So it's a very, very good thing to know. Now, the information I gave you today, if you really work towards that, you'll find rather quickly, I think, that you'll start to understand your fretboard a lot better. And the nice thing about this video, you can rewind and go back and listen to how I explain a particular thing. I would I would probably actually encourage you to do that if, if this is the type of thing that you're struggling with. Go back and listen to the first section. Master that, you know, the, the names of the open strings. Get to know those first. Really get to know them. Move on to the notes of the fifth fret. You know, get to know those really well. Master that musical alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, sharps and flats between all the notes except for B and C and E and F. A sharp, it moves a note up a semitone, you know, so it's higher in pitch, uh, or in, in the guitar terms, one fret, right? A flat moves a note lower in pitch by one fret. If we understand that, we can map the fingerboard out so effortlessly, and it's really going to expand our playing. We're going to need this because in the next lesson, I'm going to start getting into my approach to playing lead, and I'm going to start with the pentatonic scale. Everybody's, yeah, okay, I already know the pentatonic scale, right? Yes, but I've really tried to come up with some unique approaches to playing with the pentatonic scale and also teaching the pentatonic scale and using it as kind of a uh, template to be able to get into more complex modal playing and to play in some scenarios that maybe you wouldn't have thought of the pentatonic being used in. So that's what we're going to discuss next. So uh, I'll leave you with uh, what turned out to be quite a long video, but I hope that that was clear. And if there's any questions about any of this, please leave me the comments in uh, the comments section and I'll do my best to get back and answer uh, any of those that I can and clear things up for you. Um, but play around with this. Really internalize what we talked about today, even if it seems really simplistic. Even for players who've been playing for a while, if you kind of take those concepts, it, I find that it can really help to move around the fretboard. And if you already knew it, wonderful. Wait for lesson two. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, anyways, that it's. Uh, I hope that that's helped some um, uh, out there. If you don't mind, hit the subscribe button. I'm going to be doing some really what I hope to be really interesting uh, lessons. You know, um, covering information in a way that I found very successful through all the uh, years and actually decades that I was teaching guitar to lots of students, and I had some great success with. Um, with a lot of them that, that put the effort into into learning uh, uh, these little steps that I, I took them through. And there, I have a lot of similar ideas for lead and rhythm playing that I'm going to cover over. I hope this uh, turns out to be a very long uh, series. So again, thanks for liking it and thanks for watching. Please hit the subscribe button if you can. Uh, feel free to share the video. And I'll see you next time uh, for another lesson real soon.